over the years we've had a lot of indie games that fall into that sort of retro throwback kind of style. And I tell you what, some of these have been fantastic. This one here, for example, Kaze and the Wild Masks. This is an absolute must play if you like the Super Nintendo Donkey Kong Country games, because this, this is basically a Super Nintendo Donkey Kong Country game, and it's great. But if there's one thing that's really starting to attract me more and more towards the indie platformer scene lately, it's the fact that we finally reached that point where people like me, with the same nostalgic memories of the 3D platformer golden age, are not only getting together to make their own 3D platformers, but they're even purposely making them look like those old games too. Another one of these kind of games called Corn Kids 64 was brought to my attention recently by a friend of mine. He was actually one of the people that helped out with the QA on this one. So, uh, yeah, if I go through the credits, and uh, yeah, there he is. Anyway, I thought I'd check it out, and the trailer on the Steam page makes it look like the exact kind of game I want to play right now, so for the sake of £5.89, I thought I'd give it a go. And yeah, I may not be the biggest name on this website by any stretch of the imagination, but I do really like these kind of jumping around platformer games, and this one would have flown completely under my radar if it weren't for the recommendations. So consider this video me just doing the same. You know, I'm just throwing it out there in case anybody else is interested. So with that, let's check out Corn Kids 64. So, the first thing that grabbed my attention, even from the trailer on the Steam page, was just how this game looks. Even here on the main menu, talk about hitting the 64-bit visual aesthetic on the head. Now, this isn't my first rodeo playing a game that's been purposely made to look this way, but I do think Corn Kids is the first one I've played in a while that really nails it. The low-poly models and environments here just scream out the visual styles of things like Glover, 41, Winks, and all sorts of other B-grade platformers of that era, complete with chunky character models and low-res tile textures. I love this. The way all of these characters are animated too, they're so expressive, pulling these crazy faces at each other, and even the slow walk animation has your guy tiptoeing around like he's a cartoon character. This is great, look at it. You've also got a few classic 3D platformer game traits popping up, like this, having one level with multiple remixes of the same overall music, meaning different areas of the level are reflected with different instrumentation. And in general, I just really like the selection of music here. It's kind of trippy, but really catchy too. I did end up emailing the developer about this because I wanted to use the music in this video, but I couldn't find it anywhere. And it turns out the entire track list here is comprised of a lot of random chip tunes that were pulled and licensed from an old website full of artists that made these things ages ago, like way back in the early 2000s. So yeah, that's one way of this being authentic, I guess. But hey, regardless of when it was made, catchy music is catchy music, right? So uh, yeah, I've got to give a shout out to this one, the melody used in the first level because, oh man, it's so catchy. It's like... Yes! The other thing you may have noticed is the screen filter, which surprisingly I am a big fan of here. It's actually perfect for what it does. I'm usually not into this sort of thing because I've played a few games before now where they try and include a retro filter and it just ends up looking shit or they miss the mark in some way. Here though, I feel like a lot of time and care went into getting this just right. You know, it's subtle enough for it to not be in the way, but it's still very much there and overall, I think it really does add to those chunky 64-bit vibes. 
vibes. That said, I also like how at the same time this game does have some modern tricks up its sleeve and it blends them into this old school visual style pretty seamlessly. On occasion you'll come across these mirror portals for example and they actually give a full on reflection of what it's pointing at true to the angle that the mirror is actually facing. It's pretty impressive but it also doesn't look out of place either so yeah that, that's really cool I like that. Anyway by default the game will boot up in 4x3 and have this CRT filter applied and I'd personally recommend just keeping it that way because one it just looks sick and two I feel like the entire game's art style has kind of been made with this in mind. You can of course turn any of these filters off and even play the game in widescreen if you want to but I don't know, this just looks wrong to me. Give me them 4x3 chunky visuals any day. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Anyway, as far as the story's concerned, there's not much here, but instead of it just being as simple as me saying there's not much story here, Corn Kids kind of rolls with that and has it be this totally nonsensical story about this one-horned goat kid or a unicorn kid, if you will. Ah ha, ah ha, give me that being stuck in a dream about some liminal space looking nacho emporium. But the inside of the restaurant is gone, so he has to go on this massive quest to save a town full of pigs from an evil owl overlord, all because he just wants to have a dream about a big bowl of nachos. Uh, yeah, sure, okay. Things are at their silliest if you pay attention to the dialogue as well. So much of this is the most nonchalant, dumb, juvenile stuff you can think of, but I mean that in a good way. It's just being silly for the fun of it, and I'm here for that. This is good. So, as for actually playing this one, if the footage wasn't obvious enough so far, it's a sort of 3D platformer collectathon with the overall structure and game feel being somewhere in the middle of Banjo Kazooie and Super Mario 64. Here, you've got yourself a character that's a little weighty to move around with a much bigger emphasis on going around and interacting with things and doing tasks given to you by NPCs for some kind of collectible reward, kind of like Banjo Kazooie. But at the same time, once you get used to this move, set, there's actually quite a lot you can master with moves that string into one another in precise ways, and special items that can temporarily change the way you move around using some of those moves, which is kind of like Super Mario 64, so it's somewhere in the middle really, with certain areas leaning into either one of those playstyles depending on what's going on. And while I'm at it, we've got to talk about that move set. Now before I get into the crazy wizard platforming malarkey like this, I've got to give a bit of attention to a simple move that gets a lot of use out of it, with that being the horn dive. Yeah, so our little goat buddy here can charge his horn forwards to bash into enemies, break open things, and it's generally the main way you're going to interact with a lot of things throughout this game because there's a lot of gears to turn and screws to unscrew. Machinery will often require a red gear to be spun around a few times in order to make it do something, boxes will be held shut with screws, collectibles will be hidden behind screws, hey, some of the collectibles themselves are actually the screws, so yeah, screw everything. And to do this, you'll hit the attack button mid-air and then smash the same button over and over again to spin that thing around, which feels pretty good paired with the animation and sound effects. Everything else on the exploration and interaction side of things is fairly standard though. You know, you've got a 1-2-3 hit punch combo, which reminds me of Banjo-Kazooie, and then the horn dive when done on the ground, it's, again, a lot like Banjo-Kazooie. Like I say, that whole side of the gameplay does remind me a lot of Banjo-Kazooie in many ways, but when Corn Kids decides it wants to be a little tougher and throw a gauntlet your way, well, there's quite a lot of moves to master here. So you've got your basic running and jumping, that's pretty awesome obvious, but when jumping towards a wall, you can do a second jump off of it, which is kind of like a double jump, but only when you're up against a wall. If you do one of these straight upwards, you'll get a little bit of a scramble animation that'll lift you ever so slightly higher to maximise your height, but a lot of the time, you will be using this to jump over longer distances rather than up straight walls, but you know, both of these things do happen from time to time, so I've got to point them out. Either which way, this does feel really good though. If you time everything right, you can get some real 
distance when brushing up against a wall and then ending everything off with a horn dive. It just works. If you find a pipe or some kind of thin tube, you can climb up those, as well as any horizontal ones letting you walk across them. One thing I like about these is how you can quickly swap between standing on top of them or hanging from beneath them by pressing the crouch or jump button depending on where you are. There are a few enemies that'll do the same, so you have to try and avoid them by being in the opposite position, which is a little finicky at times, but I do like it, especially the little flip animations that happen when you do this. But in general, I do like how snappy these things are to grab or land on, and if you launch towards one of these with the horn dive, then Billy Goat Gruff here will do a little flip into position, which just looks and feels really good. Oh, and speaking of thin ledges, get a load of this. It's not too often you actually need it, but whenever you like, you can just press this dedicated button for an aerial view of what you're walking on. I kind of wish more 3D platformers had this. And yeah, alongside the jump, you can also use that horn dive mid-air to lunge forward and hit a wall, but assuming you haven't already used your double wall jump thing, you can then jump out of the wall bonk animation to try and reach whatever it is that's above you. And it's that relationship between using the horn dive and knowing whether or not you still have that extra jump in reserve that kinda ends up being the foundation for everything else, really. From there, you've got things like bubbles or birds or basically anything that's floating in the air like this in front of you that you can bounce off of. Then there's these floating wall panels that give you an extra wall jump each time you hit into one, so you gotta kinda go up and up and up like a set of stairs. And then there's these arrow panels in the wall that when bonked into, freaking bazooka you up into the air which can then lead into everything else. Later on you'll unlock a drill for the dive move, meaning any dirt surfaces can be blasted through in any direction, which makes some of the platforms themselves become a bit of a puzzle. And then you've got these these bomb birds which can be picked up and chucked around to make things explode, as well as their weird springy cousins that can be used to bounce all over the place. All of this does sound like a bit of a mess when I say it out loud, but you are shown how a lot of this works in the uh, tutorial level, I guess. And all of this comes together really well when the game goes full on gauntlet mode, with all of these things happening one after another. Getting through some of these towards the end of the game after having almost mastered all of these moves throughout my playtime. So good. Now, before things get to that level of crazy, it's fairly straightforward really. You know, everything's mostly laid out like your normal 3D collectathon platformer, but on a smaller scale because this is a fairly short game. So you've got a hub area, a tutorial level, a handful of challenge levels, a couple of platform gauntlets, and a, uh, a proper level, I guess. It is kind of hard to label most of these things as what I just said though, because for such a small game, there is quite a lot going on here, more than you'd think anyway, especially in the two open-ended levels. The tutorial level, for example. This really does just feel like a normal level, with the exception of these literal sticky notes left all over the place to explain the controls. Aside from that, there's a full-on level here, with some strange and quirky visuals, its own enemies and challenges, a bunch of collectibles, and even a unique character giving you a quest in the form of this legally distinct grumpy trash puppet. Hey, get a load of this guy, he looks like a purple Muppet dork. Wait, what? And that second level, the palindromic Wollows Hollow. Yeah, this place is massive. There's so much to do here in this one level that it took up around 80% of my total playtime trying to find everything in here, and even then, I still didn't. You'll go around and collect things and speak to a bunch of the various NPCs for hints as to where you may need to go next, and every now and then you'll find a door with a number on it. These will only open if you've found enough of this game's collectible floating doodads. Uh, you know, just think something like the gems in the Spyro games or the music notes in Banjo-Kazooie, and that's basically what these are. They're floating cubes, and you gotta go grab them all. But as far as the level layout's concerned, it's fairly well thought out, I think, with a lot of things naturally crossing your path that will make sense later on. Like those red gears I mentioned earlier, spinning these around will activate machinery or trigger events, but the actual gear handles themselves are collectibles, so you'll often find the machine before being able to use it, then you'll get sidetracked, find a gear whilst doing something else, and it's like constantly getting stuck and having that eureka moment when you figure out what to do with the things you have. Sometimes this is 
isn't a problem at all, and it feels great to find something new when it was so well hidden, but I'm not gonna lie, some of this stuff is way too cryptic for its own good at times. And while I think most of the level is laid out in a way for you to easily spot something in the distance that you may not have tried out, with just how much stuff there is to do here, and without a screen to really help you keep track of it all, well, for me, I was so focused on looking everywhere else that I totally forgot about this one door tucked away inside a building that has something on the other side of it that's required in order to make any progress here, so I spent quite a long time searching for something I didn't really need to search for because I kind of already knew where it was, I just also got lost with the amount of things there are for you to potentially do at any given time. You know, just keeping track of it all in my head and where I've already been while still trying to keep an eye out for things to do towards the end of the game to max out that collectible meter, it was getting pretty difficult. Something else that didn't really help in my case was the heads-up display and how it keeps track of these bottle caps. There's five of them throughout the entire game and I found a few of them in this second level so I decided to go back to the first level and take a look around there. Now the heads-up display does actually show you how many you have left to find at all times regardless of whether or not you're in the correct level to find them. So I probably ended up spending another hour looking for one of these in this level not knowing it was never here in the first place. Anyway, going into more random collectible bullshit, after you find five of these magical disco balls, you can then use them to activate a machine that flips the entire level around whilst keeping your character the same. And to its credit, this does actually change how a few things work. Namely, all of those screws you've been turning in order to activate machinery, because naturally, you're now going to be spinning them the other way around, which leads to a few new hidden areas, a few new hidden collectibles, and more importantly, a path to this level's boss fight. I don't really feel the need to show or tell too much of this area that leads up to that, you know, it's a solid enough gauntlet and the boss fight itself is a pretty good test of all the skills you've learnt throughout the game, but even then, once you beat that guy, this still isn't the end with another, even better platforming gauntlet to end everything off. But even then, that still isn't the end, because for anybody brave and thorough enough, another, even harder tower to climb is waiting for you, and it is really difficult. Like, I try. I really did try, but as of making this video, I can't beat that thing. I'm definitely going to come back and give it another go at some point though, because I'm not going to let this thing beat me forever. But yeah, that's the most of what I had to say on this one really. There's a few smaller issues here, but nothing that I feel is going to ruin the overall experience by any means. Like the bonus challenges for instance. I think these are fun, but I'm not totally sold on the idea of losing health for failing any of them. But to be fair, the checkpoints are usually not that far away, and if you ever get a game over here, you'll just get sent back to whichever checkpoint you were last at anyway, so that issue kind of fixes itself. And I guess when trying to find enough collectibles to unlock that final door leading to the last level, that was getting pretty tough towards the end. I mean, it is doable, and thankfully you don't have to collect everything in the entire game because there is a bit of wiggle room here, but I kind of wish there was just that little bit more. And overall, I think the main issue for a select few people will be how cryptic and difficult this game is going to be to fully complete, because I honestly have no idea where some of these collectibles could be now, and I've scoured this game pretty thoroughly for around seven and a half to eight hours, but meh, you know, I'm pretty happy enough with what I've played, and with this sort of thing, I just kind of know when to call it quits these days. But yeah, that's Corn Kid 64. It's a pretty solid 3D platformer with some nice controls, wacky characters, and a kick ass 64 bit presentation. So, if you like those sort of old-school collectathon platformers and have a soft spot for those chunky-looking low-poly visuals, then I think there's a lot to like here. And while I'm not going to lose sleep over the fact I didn't 100% complete Corn Kid 64, I am glad I didn't sleep on the game itself because it ended up being pretty good, especially considering it only costs £5, so... Yeah, you know, spend this much money and you'll get a pretty good game, I guess.